Thank you, Professor Bukharian and Professor Terina, for the invitation. Uh, I have the privilege of coming many, many times a year to Russia. I've been, I'm not saying in every city, but I've been in, in many of them, and very often together with you, Professor Terina. Um, stroke and coronary surgery, should we avert it, and can we avert it? If we follow a cohort of 10,000 patients for 20 years after coronary surgery, we see that at around uh, 20 years, 15% of the surviving cabbage will suffer from stroke. So there is a very tight association of uh, uh, both uh, pathologies and for different reasons. There's a constant risk of stroke. Uh, for a cabbage patient, it's around 0.5% per year. When, you're, uh, when you've learned your lessons from Blackstone and Kirkland, you know that there's never such a thing as a constant risk. But that's something that we could guess, that there is something like a constant risk in the range of 0.5% per year. But in fact, there is a major problem, because we can easily talk about these curves, but in fact, this is the reality. The reality is, is that in traditional coronary surgery, there is an early risk. There's an early risk, and there's a major problem in coronary surgery in the first 10 days. It, did, it, did, it fades away after around day 10. And that's, so the results from the syntax trial should not astonish us. In fact, if you look on the yellow plots, which is the, 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 the PCI arm, you see that they're around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. So it's exactly the values that we, we noticed in this huge cohort that we followed match exactly uh, the problem. But in fact, here is the problem, is that in coronary surgery, the first year, they had a 2.2% stroke risk in the syntax trial. And afterwards, again, we see again this 0 0.5, 0 0.6 value coming up. Now, in the syntax, the conclusion by those running the syntax trial was that it doesn't make any difference at four years. Well, that's not really true. Um, it is so that it's not any more significant. Uh, because, of course, we know that, but there is an early problem. So we do have a problem that we cannot um, just accept as it is. Let's have a look at uh, three consecutive cohorts. Um, the first uh, 14,000 patients operated in Leuven, then a cohort of around 3,000 patients, and a cohort of 3,000 patients. And in traditional coronary surgery, we had exactly the same result as the syntax trial. This is around 1.5% uh, around surgery, but you have to add around 0 0.5 uh, to um, for the annual risk, so then we come for the first year up to around 2%, which is exactly matching the syntax trial. But we have been lucky in the, in the second cohort where, in fact, we moved over to OPCAP. We were still touching the aorta in this phase. Um, we were still doing some uh, combined procedures, carotid and coronary surgery, and we did not ligate the left atrial appendage. And we were able to bring that risk down from 1.5 to 0 0.8. So it, it was a, a major reduction, but still it was hitting me very strongly in the face that we were not reaching what we should reach. Uh, we're very proud to say that through a number of steps, and that's the subject of this talk, um, um, stroke is gone. Um, stroke is gone, but it gives you a dramatic uh, um, observation is that um, these patients, um, we're talking about 250 patients who had a stroke in Leuven through coronary surgery. So that's a catastrophic number. It's like five buses of patients. It's like a whole Airbus of patients. After 21,000 coronary bypass patients, it's like a whole Airbus of patients who had a stroke. Some of them have had uh, minimal symptoms when they left the hospital, but we all know that some of these with minimal symptoms, they cry when they should laugh. I mean, something was dramatically damaged inside. If we then look back to the strategy map of uh, cardiac surgery, well, our mission is to improve the survival and the quality of life of the patients. And in fact, we have failed in our mission if we're sending 250 patients home with a stroke. If they have survived the stroke. So basically, it's 250 patients where we failed dramatically in our mission. I've tried to put up in this slide a number of elements why people have stroke. 
Well, would they have stroke because we manipulate a very diseased aorta which is associated with atherosclerosis? Because they have hemodynamic instability and, of course, this interface with a normal or maybe a pathological cerebral circulation because of the anesthesia during the bypass, after the bypass, and maybe anti-aggregation, anticoagulation, and finally uh, the atrial fibrillation, and I'm not talking here that much about the chronic atrial fibrillation, but I'm more talking about the acute atrial fibrillation runs that we have around surgery. Now, a number of uh, studies, this is an observational study, showed that OPCAP uh, reduced uh, the risk of stroke. Um, this study, a randomized control st study, similarly uh, clearly identified um, a group of randomized studies. I'm sorry, excuse me for the misphrasing, also favors OPCAP. So clearly OPCAP reduces the risk of stroke, and I've shown you that in our own result. And uh, again, a group of randomized control trials, always the same. Stroke is uh, res less risk if you do the procedure of pump. So driven through a number of elements and major driven through uh, the issue of the stroke, uh, we uh, changed in 1999 to a complete OPCAP approach, and in fact we do that in all the coronary bypass patients by all the surgeons, 24-7 uh, every time of the day. And we exclude the patients in cardiac massage, cardiogenic shock, and cardiogenic shock with uh, bad saturations. In fact, it's not even true because um, Last week, we did a patient who, uh, uh, when he came into the operating theater, went into cardiac massage. But after 15 minutes of cardiac massage, we were able to, the anesthesiologist, because I wasn't doing much, the anesthesiologist was able to stabilize the patient. And then we did the procedure of pump, and he didn't have a, a, a stroke through the procedure. So if we look more seriously at our own data, and this is on the first uh, 3,000 patients, if we compared them with the last 1,500 patients, and we use the correct method of uh, statistics, excluding the acute uh, patients in, in um, acute emergency dramatic surgery, we didn't did a saturated propensity score and additional multivariate correction. There was no, no discussion that in our hands the stroke was reduced. But the stroke being reduced is not acceptable stroke must be annihilated. So this result um, was even for us totally unacceptable. If we now plot it in a time-related phase, you can see that indeed as early risk of stroke has changed, but now there is a noise, and you, a noise of stroke, and you want to get rid of the noise. Now, what was our own evidence if you build uh, after 250 patients of pump? We had already a p-value that is uh, statistically significant using a number of correcting variables. So you see, you can see that by growing experience in the off-pump, the p-value was monitored very strictly, and indeed we kept on seeing uh, this information. If we now look at some of the randomized uh, control trials, and, and they have a number of patients, usually a lot less than, than what we have in our cohorts, we see that, um, but of course, some of these randomized control trials in off-pump were still touching the aorta, still clamping the aorta some uh, two, three times. For example, the DORS trial at the average uh, uh, three clamps on the aorta, off-pump three clamps on the aorta. The same thing with the RUBY, an average of three clamps on the aorta per case, they were still showing that they had not been able to get rid of stroke. Of course not, because they had not gone all the way, and they made, in fact, the mistakes that we made around uh, more than 10 years ago. So we've taken a number of additional steps. We have nearly totally stopped the combined carotid and cabbage procedure. We restricted to the very the patients with unstable neurological condition, even in the presence of very severe stenosis uni or bilateral. So you, and we all know that the, the unstable neurological condition is a very rare uh, situation. We have totally stopped uh, touching the aorta. We, we don't ever touch the aorta for years now. We have upgraded the anticoagulation and the aggregation therapy after surgery for therapeutic levels, and we ligate the left atrial appendage in nearly all patients, in fact, those where we have the guts uh, to do it because sometimes the access is, uh, is, is not uh, so easy. I can skip that. So, and, and we'll come to some of these elements. So, 
the manipulation of the aorta and the partial or total cross clamping. So this is what you see here is the number of proximal anastomosis on the aorta in Leuven, and you see that in 1997 for triple vessel disease, the blue line, we were clamping the aorta around 1.5 times. And we've not changed in one week here. We, it, it took us quite a bit to gradually reduce that number of clamps on the aorta. But basically, since 2006, 2007, which is eight years ago, we've stopped touching that aorta. The hemodynamic instability and its interface with the pathological circulation. Well, one of the major issues in off-pump is uh, conversion. My next lecture will, will discuss that. But it's obvious that if you have a high rate of conversions, you are going to dramatically increase your risk of, um, of stroke because of the hemodynamic instability. Here you see uh, the number of conversions on the first 4,200 patients. Our conversion rate is 0 0.28, so it's incredibly rare. Um, for example, the last 3,000 off-pumps done by a younger surgeon, there has been zero conversion. The anti-aggregation issue, well, in this uh, study published in the Heart Surgery Forum, I know it's not uh, the highest quoted, but it, was an, it gives us interesting information that if the patient is operated on the pump and you do a thromboelastogram, you can see that um, in day zero, you have a dramatic uh, loss of, uh, going, of reduction of uh, coagulation, but then there is this increase. But in OPCAP, you do not lose this because you don't lose your coagulation factors, but you have the same uh, issue after surgery. So it means that in off-pump surgery, you are associated with a hypercoagulative state, which many people forget. So there is a dramatic hypercoagulative state in the off-pump coronary bypass patients. And this is why we have moved over from, uh, from prophylactic levels of anti-aggregation after surgery to uh, therapeutic levels. Without, in fact, having an association of gastric bleeding, I was very scared to have higher levels of anti-aggregation, but it seems that uh, the stomach protection has also improved. Atrial fibrillation, it's of course, you have to be very, very careful when you talk about atrial fibrillation in the presence of Jim Cox, but uh, I was one of his scholars in the early 80s uh, to study uh, what uh, his, his work was doing, so I, of course, I do have a high respect. Let's have a look at uh, OPCAP and atrial fibrillation. What you see here is a freedom from atrial fibrillation, and you see that in Leuven at day eight, we have around 18% of the patients who do atrial fibrillation. So yes, atrial fibrillation, there is a risk. Now, having the patient at a high level of anti-aggregate therapy, you might imagine that the patient is covered for the risk of developing clots in the left atrial appendage. Um, it turned out the, that the answer was yes, but not a complete answer because there still was a gap between um, taking out the chest strains and, and really having the effect of the anti-aggregate therapy and it's to close that window and certainly also close the window at home sometimes that uh, we have decided to go for uh, ligature of the left uh, atrial appendage. And you see here the situation before. We ligate it not in a horizontal plane, we, we ligate in an oblique plane so that it, it uh, very closely fits. Uh, and it's, it's with a minor stitch on the front and on the back so that the thread does not uh, uh, slip. For some reason. Thank you. Um, and of course, there could be discussion about this left atrial appendage. And again, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, careful uh, in the presence of Jim uh, to discuss that. He knows about these things much more than I do. Um, we know that from pulse Doppler studies that there is an early diastolic emptying flow. We know that the left atrial appendage has an intrinsic uh, late diastolic contraction. Um, we know that the left atrial appendage uh, causes an early systolic negative wave. So we, we know that the left atrial appendage has a number of consequences. Um, but in this publication uh, published in American Heart in 2005, 30% of the atrial natriuretic peptide is produced in the atrial appendage. Uh, but uh, this study was not able to identify any excess in heart failure or perioperative diuretic use. And that's what we were most scared of when we ligated the left atrial appendage. 
So, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, conclude with this slide. To the best of our knowledge today, the combination of off-pump surgery may be the surgeon's best tool to avoid some but not all of the neurological complications after bypass surgery. Prophylactic antiarrhythmic therapy, antithrombotic therapy, as well as an aggressive treatment of the perioperative atrial fibrillation may further reduce the incidence of neurological events, as was cited in the European Heart Journal. But I personally believe that it demands a full multifactorial approach from the surgeon and the surgical team if you do the procedure correctly and you take a number of additional steps. Uh, you are able to get rid of uh, this dramatic uh, complication of surgery. I thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for this um, excellent overview, and especially drawing our attention to hypercoagulability yes. after any kind of cardiac surgery, yeah. which is an important fact to, to bear in mind. Um, any comments about this? question. The May I have a question? Yeah. Uh, the latest tendency in, in literature, what I'm reading, you know, there was mentioned and also it was uh, discussed at the last AATC meeting that uh, this very high quality surgery cannot be done by regular cardiac surgeons. I mean, mean uh, off pump surgery, okay? How do you consider that? Uh, so we have thousands of surgeons doing uh, bypass surgery. Can we have, uh, uh, can we um, have uh, so uh, time, will this time come when uh, any cardiac surgeon doing, let's say, uh, valvular surgery or so can become uh, the surgeon for off pump with the good results? I just, uh, you know, I it's, mean, individual. Uh, it's, um, um, it's a little bit discuss better discussed in my next talk. So there's oh, two okay. possibilities. I would prefer you ask the same question again after the second okay, talk. Okay. Yes. <laughs> because it goes about the learning process. Yeah, this is a real uh, question for, I think. Professor Manikante. I am a doctor. Uh, <coughs> Paul, uh, you stress out in your presentation uh, that it's important the heart team to have a good results. And probably is much more important that of pump techniques because you know our team very well and we, we are working very close, uh, closer. And um, in the last 3,000 patients that we operated on, we had the same <coughs> incidence of stroke as 0 0.1. And the last 1,000, we have zero. And yes. all our patients are done in extracorporeal circulation and cross clamp. So can you comment that? Um, it, it's always possible to, to find the cohorts where you have indeed um, uh, less stroke. But if you look at the syntax trial, if you look at the Ruby trial, if you look at the DORS trial, um, in the literature, um, it stays with this 1.5 percent to 2 percent. Um, I must say that the 1.5% the, the that we had was already reducing the number of, of approaches on the aorta. We were doing sequential grafting and our sequential arterial grafting since the, since the 70s. Um, we do um, bilateral memory arteries uh, in situ since 1972, so, so, so that is there. The reality is that indeed the stroke rate is high. When I discuss this with my guests, and I'll also discuss this uh, in, in my next lecture, when I discuss this with my guests, most of the people have no information about the stroke rate that they have in their unit. Um, they, they say, I don't remember a single patient, but, but that's of course not how the data should be made. You should have follow-up. We have complete follow-up of our patients beyond hospital stay. And, and indeed, more patients than we think have a stroke uh, in the days, even after hospital discharge. Mm. Paul, the, atrial, the uh, stroke is an extremely multifactorial event, yes. and it's very difficult to pinpoint a, a single fact. Do you have a special procedure if you identify a patient you will be doing OPCAP who has a high risk, let's say, uh, you, visible calcification in the aorta, atheroma in TE, uh, already existing thrombus in LA, 
Uh, are there any special measures in that? Y yes, um, the, um, uh, you, you state very correctly the multifactorial effect. If there is a clot in the left atrial appendage, we don't like it. it. Of course, this means that the anesthesiologist has to do a transesophageal echo in every patient, but that's a routine in our hospital. Um, the aorta is very clear. We don't touch the aorta. That's over. Um, there's zero touch aorta. I have not done a proximal anastomosis in five years, I think. I mean, the proximal anastomosis looks to me like a strange event. Um, uh, if I see it. I have not clamped an aorta. And of course, we are operating patients. When I, when I was young, one day I have been young, uh, the patients were 55 years old, but now our patients are 78, 80, 85 years old. Their aortas are as sick as, as, the, as the whole body of these patients. So um, the, the no-touch aorta, I think, is essential. The, the, now, the anesthesia takes a number of approaches. Um, uh, certainly, if we know uh, in that the patient is high risk for stroke, and then we would call this patient high risk for stroke, the patient who has an occlusion on one side and maybe an 80% uh, stenosis on the other side, we do not do the combined procedure uh, with carotid and, and surgery, but we will increase the perfusion pressures a little bit higher. So the, the, the perfusion pressures during surgery will be maintained at around 110, 120, whilst in normal coronary surgery, we let it drift to around 100 millimeters mercury. But and you rely that. on that purely arterial grafting yes. even in the presence of a severely hypertrophied left ventricle in yes. a, and in the presence of unstable angina. Well, en médecine comme en amour, ni jamais ni toujours, uh, but, um, in, for, excuse me uh, for the translation, um, in medicine as in love, not never, 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 always. Um, um, but in most of the, nearly all the patients get complete arterial revascularization. Nearly all of the patients, yes. How about uh, redo cases? Yes, all the redo coronary surgery is done off pump. All the redo coronary surgery off pump. But I want to, to maybe just refine my answer given to Professor Turina. You must understand, I mean, um, I think close to 100 Russian surgeons have been in Leuven for three days uh, in these seminars. Um, off pump is done in Leuven with zero extra systole. So there's not even one extra systole. So it's very strict protocol. Can you um, name those guys from Russia? Of course. At I least have, one. <laughs> I, have, I have the complete list of the names of 100 surgeons. And in fact, there's, a, there's a four more coming in uh, this month, later this month. OK. Then I, I, the, re the reason I'm asking, so we will be lucky very soon, I guess, eh, in Russia. Well, the, I, you know, the, it depends what they come for to Leuven, and Leuven is the, the largest brewery of the world is in Leuven, so I don't know if they come for the surgery or if they come for the brewery. Uh, I hope they come for some, of, some elements of the surgery. <laughs>